100 kilometers northeast of Sudbury in the Canadian province of Ontario lies the small town of Cobalt, population around only 1,000 people. There isn't much left today. Like many former mining towns scattered across the province, Cobalt went boom and bust long ago, leaving it a shell of its former self. But in its heyday, Cobalt was a powerhouse, a source of a significant percentage of the world's silver and the birthplace of hard rock mining in Canada. But the town had another, less well-known claim to fame, located some 16 kilometers southeast on the banks of the Montreal River. Until the 1980s, a spectacular white rooster tail of water shot up from the banks of the Montreal River, sending a curtain of mist drifting across the surrounding woodlands. This man-made geyser marked the site of an engineering marvel, the Ragged Chute Compressed Air Plant, which despite having no moving parts, reliably supplied power to the surrounding mines for more than a century. This is the story of one of the most ingenious, elegant engineering projects in history and the forgotten engineer who created it. Silver was discovered in the Cobalt area in 1903, causing a booming mining industry to spring up almost overnight. The silver ore, conveniently located close to the surface, contained a large proportion of cobalt metal, which gave the town its name. Incorporated in 1906, by 1909 Cobalt's population had soared to more than 10,000 people, and by 1911 it was the fourth largest silver producer in the world, the 34 surrounding mines producing 30 million ounces of silver per year, nearly 9% of the global supply. At first, excavation was done largely by hand, but as the shafts and drifts extended ever further into the ground, the need grew for increased mechanization. At first, a coal-fired plant was constructed to generate electricity and compressed air for lights, hoists, rock drills, and other equipment, but this soon proved exorbitantly expensive to operate. The plant consumed some 100,000 tons of coal per year, which at the contemporary rate of $5.50 a ton meant that one drill operating 18 hours per day could cost up to $250 a month, far more than a typical miner's salary at the time. Thankfully, a more economical source of power was close at hand, the Montreal River, which featured numerous rapids ideal for generating hydroelectricity. In 1906, brothers C.A. and B.C. Bede formed the Cobalt Power Company Limited and obtained a lease to build a hydroelectric dam at Hound Shoot Falls, approximately 10 kilometers from Cobalt. Due to uncertainties regarding the stability of the silver market, the project was delayed several years, construction finally beginning in 1908 and the plant opening in 1910, with a generating capacity of 3.5 megawatts or 4,600 horsepower. Another generating unit was added in 1911, increasing its capacity to 9.5 megawatts or 12,700 horsepower. Though the plant still operates to this day, soon after its completion it was supplanted in its intended role by a far more elegant and ingenious piece of engineering, the Ragged Chute Compressed Air Plant, designed by brilliant Canadian engineer Charles Taylor. Born in Chatham, New Brunswick on January the 20th, 1859, Charles Havelock Taylor was the eighth child and first son born to Charles Taylor Sr., a construction engineer, and his wife Mary. Fast forward to 1876 and the Taylor family moved to Montreal, where the elder Charles's company had been awarded a contract to build a section of the Lachine Canal. Soon afterward, the young Charles Jr. began work as a mining claim investigator for his uncle, who owned the Howard Watch Company of New York City. Over the following decade, Taylor traveled to sites all across the continent, becoming a highly competent, self-taught mining expert, prospector, and mechanical engineer. He applied these skills to a whole host of endeavors, developing a gold mine in Mattock, Ontario, and a steam laundry and ice skate factory in Montreal. Then, in 1895, while working on the Buckingham Dam near Ottawa, he noticed an unusual phenomenon. During the winter, water flowing over the dam spillway carried air bubbles under the frozen surface of the river, which rose rose and collected to form large ice domes. When Taylor drilled into one of these domes, to his surprise, the trapped air rushed out under high pressure. Taylor reasoned that the air was being compressed by the weight of the water column as it was carried beneath the surface and realized that if water was diverted down a long vertical shaft, this process could be harnessed to generate a reliable source of compressed air. Using scale models, he began tinkering with variations in shaft depth and diameter to achieve optimum performance. Unknown to Taylor, he had independently reinvented a much older device known as a tromp. 
Invented in Italy in the 17th century and named after the French word for trunk, trompes were most extensively used by ironworkers in Catalina, Spain to continuously supply air to their bloomeries or smelting furnaces. In this design, water in an elevated trough or head race flowed down a vertical pipe or downcomer. This was fitted with a restriction or venturi, which created a suction that drew in air bubbles through a series of inlet holes. The column of water carried the bubbles down to a container called a wind box, where it impacted a platform platform or bench. The water then drained out the bottom of the wind box while the now compressed air was drawn out the top into a blast pipe and used to stoke the furnace. Much later, engineers attempted to significantly increase the size and power of tromps. For example, in 1877, one J.P. Frizzle constructed a 1.5 meter or 5 foot tall example on the Mississippi River at the St. Anthony Falls near St. Paul, Minnesota. But while Taylor did not originate the idea, he nonetheless went on to implement the tromp principle on a far larger scale than had ever been attempted before. Taylor's first large-scale compressed air plant was built at Magog, Quebec, 100 kilometers east of Montreal, to power the Dominion Cotton Mills Company's printing works. The factory had previously experimented with various combinations of steam, electric, and compressed air power to operate its printing presses, but none proved satisfactory. Taylor's 115 kilowatt or 150 horsepower hydraulic plant, which produced compressed air at 358 kilopascals or 51 pounds per square inch, first opened on August the 12th, 1896, and was an immediate success, operating almost continuously until 1953. In 1898, Taylor formed the Kootenai Air Supply Company and built a 450 kilowatt or 600 horsepower compressor at Ainsworth, British Columbia, to supply the Caslow Mining Company's planned copper mine. However, the Great Northern Railroad did not build its promised spur line to the site, and the mine never opened, setting Taylor back some $60,000, around two. $2.3 million in today's money. But Taylor's greatest success would be at the Ragged Chute, seven kilometers downstream of the Hound Chute Hydroelectric Dam on the Montreal River, which he first visited in 1905. Taylor promised local mine owners a plant which could provide a continuous supply of 862 kilopascal or 125 psi air and require almost no maintenance or manpower to operate. As you might imagine, many dismissed his proposal as impossible with one mine owner describing Taylor as a crazy two-bit so-called engineer, self-taught little better than a mechanic with a bunch of wacky ideas. And speaking of wacky ideas, if you're enjoying this video so far, please do hit that subscribe button. Subscribing to Today I Found Out is scientifically proven to make you irresistible to your crush, according to the words that just came out of my mouth. In any event, despite some initial pushback, Taylor managed to secure the needed funds and construction was completed in 1910. The Ragged Chute compressed air plant was a marvel of simplicity and rugged engineering. A 200 meter or 650 foot wide, 20 meter or 65 foot high dam diverting water into a set of intake heads, the height of which could be adjusted to maintain a constant constant hydraulic head, a measure of a fluid's potential energy, of around 46 centimeters or 18 inches. Through the intake heads, the water flowed through a restriction into a vertical shaft 106 meters or 350 feet deep and 3 meters or 10 feet in diameter. This restriction lowered the water's pressure via the Venturi effect, sucking down inlet pipes and entraining the bubbles in the falling water column. As the bubbles were swept downwards, the air was compressed to a degree proportional to the height, or head, of the hydraulic column. Efficient operation required the shaft to be as smooth and perfectly cylindrical as possible, so Taylor designed a special circular drilling platform for the excavators and patched any irregularities in the stone walls using concrete. At the bottom of the shaft, the water column struck a concrete cone sheathed in steel which separated the now compressed air from the water. The air then flowed along the roof of a 311 meter or 1,000 foot long horizontal tunnel until it reached an incline plenum or collection shaft. From here, the air was carried via a 60 centimeter or 23 inch diameter shaft to a valve house and then along a 52 centimeter or 20 inch outlet pipeline for distribution to the various mines in the area. Meanwhile, the water was returned to the river through a 90 meter or 295 foot high tail shaft. 
In the event production capacity exceeded demand, Taylor designed the plant with an automatic pressure relief system. A blowout pipe extended into the horizontal tunnel down to a critical water level such that when the air pressure caused the water to drop below this level, the excess air was vented to the surface, creating a spectacular 60 meter or 196 foot high geyser that soon became a major tourist attraction in the area. Having no real moving parts, the ragged chute plant required essentially no maintenance or intervention to operate except to occasionally adjust the height of the feed heads and consequently cost almost nothing to operate. Furthermore, the plant operated an astounding 82% efficiency and generated compressed air that was far cleaner and drier than from a mechanical compressor. This was because the temperature of the river water was below the dew point of the air, causing nearly all the moisture to condense out before the air reached the outlet pipe. Dry air is essential to the operation of pneumatic tools because moisture can freeze inside the tools and otherwise cause corrosion and wash away vital lubricants. Since its completion in 1910, Ragged Chute operated almost continuously for 70 years, only being briefly shut down in 1950 and 1961 for maintenance on the intake pipes. However, by then, the fortunes of the town the plant was built to serve had long since declined. By the 1930s, the silver reserves around cobalt were largely depleted and mine after mine began to close, the town steadily dwindling to its current population of less than 1,000 people. The last mine in the area, Agnico Eagle, closed in the 1980s, having produced over 420 million ounces of silver. The Ragged Chute facility was acquired by Ontario Hydro in 1945 and continued to operate until the valve house burned down and the plant was officially closed down on December the 24th, 1981. In 1991, the defunct plant was purchased by Canadian hydro developers, today TransAlta, and a conventional hydroelectric dam built on the site. Yet the legacy of Ragged Chute lives on. In 2019, the Canadian federal government announced plans to construct an updated version of Taylor's hydraulic compressor to supply compressed air to the Holloway Gold Mine in northern Ontario. The compressor, designed by Sudbury-based company Electrail Innovation, promises to reduce the mine's energy consumption by 40%, vindicating the efficiency and utility of this nearly 400-year-old technology. And as an aside, in the 1930s, the Tennessee Valley Authority attempted to build a 35 megawatt or 47,000 horsepower compressed air plant based on Taylor's design. However, one of the designers misread a critical measurement by a single digit, which caused the plant's efficiency to plummet from 82% to only 10%, a testament to the astounding exactness of Taylor's calculations. Cobalt II may soon get a reprieve from its ghost town status thanks to its namesake's metal. At the time of the town's founding, cobalt was considered a nuisance byproduct with relatively few industrial uses outside of pigments for coloring glass, ceramics, and paints. Today, however, the metal is a vital component in the lithium-ion batteries that power many electronic devices and electric cars, while the radioisotope cobalt-60 is widely used in the treatment of cancer. Traditionally, 60% of the world's cobalt has come from the Democratic Republic of Congo, a politically unstable region where the ore is often mined using child labor in deplorable working conditions. This has caused the commodity price of cobalt to rise by 300% since 2015 to over $30 an ounce, and battery manufacturers to seek out more reliable, affordable, and ethical sources for the metal, including Southwest Ontario. Indeed, in recent years, companies like First Cobalt Corporations have begun prospecting mineral deposits in the cobalt area, meaning the forgotten birthplace of Canadian hard rock mining may become a boom town once again. But whether its mines will be powered by an elegant, tailor-type compressed air plant, only time will tell. So I hope you enjoyed this video. If you did, please click subscribe to help make sure YouTube shows you other interesting videos we've done. Thank you for watching and I hope you have a fantastic day.